Lesbian fantasist invented 15 rapes and sexual assaults, which saw man jailed to get sympathy from girlfriends caught hears. Now, I know what you're thinking. A lesbian? Really? I would never have guessed that. What with the dyed hair, facial piercing and obesity? I thought she was a page three girl. Oh, that's right. They don't have those anymore, do they? A fantasist who invented rape and sexual assault allegations against 15 men to get attention from her girlfriend has been jailed for 10 years. Gemma Beale, 25, claimed she'd been raped by nine men and seriously sexually assaulted by six in four different encounters over the space of three years, causing one man to be wrongly jailed. A judge warned that her grotesque string of lies would increase the likelihood of guilty men going free and prevent real victims from reporting such crimes. Beale's first victim, Mahad Kasim, served two years and nine months in jail while she received £11,000 in criminal injuries compensation following the alleged rape. The court heard that she went on to make a string of false allegations that took up 6,400 hours of police time and cost at least £250,000. Most lies began impulsively following drunken rows with girlfriends as she sought attention and to arouse jealousy. Judge Nicholas Lorraine Smith, sitting at London's South Crown Court, told Beale she was a very, very convincing liar and enjoyed being seen as a victim. Well, that sounds like a typical social justice warrior. He added, What is particularly chilling is the manner in which you persisted in making allegations which you knew were untrue, even to the extent of committing and repeating perjury. These false allegations of rape, false allegations which will inevitably be widely publicised, are likely to have the perverse impact of increasing the likelihood of guilty men going free. Well, I don't know about that. I mean, each case should be tried on its merits. Beale's case shouldn't have any bearing on other cases. So in one case, Beale claimed she'd been groped in a pub by a man, and then that same man took part in a gang rape of her in a nearby car park. She actually cut herself with a hanging flower basket to make it look like she'd been attacked with barbed wire. In fact, CCTV footage showed she actually attacked the man in the pub and then walked home alone. So clearly this woman is a narcissistic piece of human garbage and I suspect it's gotten a fair amount of coverage because of the unusual extent of her lies. But a couple of news outlets want us to believe that false allegations themselves are rare. So this article was written by Glosswitch, and I have to say I don't blame her for not putting her real name on it. And yes, I did assume her gender. Here's a selection of other articles by Glosswitch. Notice the Chet Evans article, so clearly she has a problem with men being exonerated of crimes they didn't commit. So Glosswitch says of descriptions of Beale as attention-seeking and a serial liar. It's hard not to detect the sense of relief that accompanies the sharing of reports on Beale's crime. See, the sharers seem to be saying, we told you women lied about this stuff. As the comedian Reginald Hunter tweeted yesterday, for people who question why we question, here you go. It seems that Glosswitch has a problem with facts. Beale is a serial liar and her motives were to seek attention. And the reason why some people might feel the need to remind you that some women lie about rape is because people like you tell us that we must always listen and believe. And it appears for some time that's exactly what the police did with Beale, one poor sod spending almost three years in jail from her false allegations. Now, back at the beginning of the article, Glosswitch claims false allegations are rare and links to an article by Labor MP Keir Starmer about a special report from the CPS about false allegations of rape and domestic violence. Likewise, this Guardian article refers to that same report. It's also worth noting the startling title that suggests that Beale was somehow a victim because of a flawed system, which we find out is because she was sentenced to 10 years in prison, whereas a convicted rapist typically only gets eight years. But that's a single rapist for a single crime. Beale accused nine men of rape and six of sexual assault, one of which spent almost three years of his life in prison. So 10 years, well, that's hard to feel sympathy for her. Anyway, back to this report that demonstrates false allegations are rare. It says over a 17-month period in 2011-2012, there were 5,651 prosecutions for rape, but only 35 prosecutions for making false rape allegations. But wait a minute, isn't the claim false rape allegations are rare? Not 
prosecutions. I understand why prosecutions are rare because police generally don't go after them. When discussing rates of rape and sexual assault, activists continually chide us to ignore the prosecution rate because so many supposedly guilty men go free. Isn't that why they come up with these bogus surveys at universities with massively inflated definitions of sexual assault to tell us the real number? But now, when it suits you, you want to talk about convictions when it comes to false allegations. So if you go to the actual report, you'll find there were charges of false allegations of rape and sexual assault brought against 121 suspects. Still, that doesn't sound like a lot, but again, that's charges brought. It's hardly an accurate picture of false allegations in their entirety. How hard the police try to prove there were false allegations? Police have better things to do with their time than follow up every alleged sexual assault or rape for which there's not sufficient evidence to proceed with charges just to see whether the accuser was lying. It's only when in the course of an investigation they find obviously conflicting evidence that they bother with charging someone with false reports. Not only that, there is special guidance set out for police when pursuing charges of perverting the course of justice and wasting police time in cases of allegations of rape and sexual assault. In a section called Core Considerations, they remind prosecutors to not resort to myths and stereotypes such as victims invite offences because of the way they dress, act, or because they may be drunk, or that we shouldn't expect them to recall events consistently. Now I wonder does not being able to recall events consistently apply to other alleged crimes where trauma may be involved and if not why not? It's a little too convenient if someone can make an allegation and then later say you know what it actually didn't happen like that. There's even further guidance on societal myths on rape and sexual offences. Myth number seven being women cry rape when they regret having sex or want revenge. Implications. Reinforces stereotypes, re-victimizes and stigmatizes the victim and undermines her support for seeking justice. And then they cite the CPS report as evidence that this is exceedingly rare. Now, of course, it would be ridiculous to assume that all women do this or even a significant number. But you only have to read the campus rape frenzy to know this is not a rare occurrence. Not only that, young women in the United States are being actively encouraged to see regretful sex as akin to rape or sexual assault by activists on campus. Now, there are special considerations for youths because they may be coerced into making a false complaint or not understand the true nature of consent. There are considerations for the reasons an accuser may withdraw their accusation, such as family pressure or due to embarrassment. Now, most of this guidance seems fairly reasonable, but the point is that it is specifically designed to make sure authorities are very careful about bringing charges of false accusations. But again, this is about bringing charges and proceeding to a prosecution. It doesn't say anything about false allegations that lead to convictions that aren't overturned. Recall that from the Campus Rape Frenzy, a 2012 study estimated that of 227 men convicted of rape for whom DNA evidence was available and usable, 15% were eliminated as the source of that evidence. It also doesn't say anything about allegations where police don't follow up because resources would be better spent elsewhere. Personally, I'd like to hear from police what goes on inside a UK police department with regard to these matters. How actively do police pursue false allegations or even bother to find out if they are in fact false? I don't think the police can be blamed for not wasting resources following up every unsubstantiated claim. Presumably they have better things to do such as policing thought crimes on social media. No doubt Gemma Beale is an outlier and rape is a far bigger problem than false allegations of rape. But to minimise the frequency of false allegations sets up a system of a quasi-presumption of guilt, which is exactly what has happened on many American college campuses. So if you have experience in this area of law enforcement, let us know your thoughts about the vigour with which false rape allegations are pursued by police. I'll see you next time.